the 9th, 10th and 12th cranial nerves, the glossopharyngeal, vagus and hypoglossal nerves. These three cranial nerves are normally tested together because of their close associations in terms of origins and functions. Their nuclei are in the medulla oblongata and they supply mostly areas of the mouth, pharynx and larynx. The glossopharyngeal supplies the posterior one-third of the tongue with taste sensation. Remember, the anterior two-thirds is supplied by the facial nerve. The glossopharyngeal also supplies the mucous membranes of the tonsilla fossa. It also supplies motor to the styloglossal muscle. Its parasympathetic component supplies the parotid gland for saliva production. The descending carotid branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve supplies the baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and chemoreceptors in the carotid bodies. These sense blood pressure changes and the concentrations of blood oxygen and carbon dioxide. The sensory component of the vagus nerve supplies the tympanic membrane and external auditory structures. The vagus nerve also supplies the aortic paroreceptors and chemoreceptors. The rest of the vagus nerve supplies the many visceral structures in the thorax and abdomen up to the transverse colon. The motor component of the vagus nerve supplies the muscles of the palate, the pharynx and the larynx via the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The course of this nerve makes it clinically significant as it can become affected by mediastinal and aortic lesions. The hypoglossal nerve has no sensory function. Of clinical significance, it supplies motor to the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. The glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves can be tested together. Begin by noticing their voice. Is it hoarse? Ask the patient to cough. The inability to create an explosive cough is defined as bovine, which is rather gradual in character. Then ask the patient to open the mouth and with a torch examine the uvula and the tonsillar arches. Ask the patient to say ah. ah. That's fine, thank you. Do the uvula and the arches elevate symmetrically? Does the uvula elevate and deviate to one side? The side to which deviation occurs signifies the stronger side. Therefore, the opposite side is affected by weakness of the palatal muscles. Now test for a gag reflex. With an orange soap, touch each side of the posterior pharyngeal wall just behind the pillars of the fossas. If you haven't got clear access, then depress the tongue with a wooden spatula. Observe the elevation of the uvula and the fossas. Do they elevate at all and do they rise symmetrically? With the gag reflex, you are testing the glossopharyngeal nerve as the afferent component. The response, or the efferent part in this reflex, is performed by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve may be affected by lesions in the brainstem, extramedullary lesions, jugular foramen lesions, and with barbar palsy. Next, assess the hypoglossal nerve. Ask the patient to open their mouth and observe the passively resting tongue on the floor of the mouth. Examine its symmetry, color, and size, and look for evidence of wasting. Observe for a few seconds for the presence of involuntary movements, such as fasciculations. An abnormally large tongue is seen in acromegaly, Down's syndrome, congenital hypothyroidism, and amyloidosis. A small or unilaterally wasted tongue, which may also be fasciculating, is seen in lower motor neuron lesions, and often in motor neuron disease. Then ask the patient to protrude their tongue. Check its shape, 
symmetry and evidence of fasciculations. Does it deviate? If there is deviation, then the stronger side will push the tongue towards the weak side. Finally, assess the strength of the tongue by asking the patient to push their tongue against the inside of their cheek whilst you palpate its strength from the outside. Weakness and fasciculations of the tongue may signify motor neuron disease or any lesion affecting these nuclei or their tracts.